Hello, my name is Kieran May and the theme of my project was the stock market. I first became interested in this topic when I watched the movie The Big Short. I thought it would be fun to learn more about how the people in that movie knew what they did. Before this project, I had heard about the stock market, but I didn't know much about it. Throughout my project, I have learned a lot about the stock market, including what penny stocks are and what shorting is. After my project is over, I intend to continue learning about the stock market because I find it very interesting. My mentor Steve Gruber has over 10 years of experience in the stock market that has been invaluable to, me, invaluable to me throughout this project. At the beginning of my project, he was not the mentor I had in mind. Originally, I thought my dad's friend, Ben Statz, could be my mentor. But when Mr. Gruber found out I was doing the stock market for my project, he said he could um, be my mentor. And I gladly accepted. I'm glad I did this because he has been able to help me with any questions I have had and help me come up with my final project. Pro product. I have learned many things throughout my project. I think the most important of those is that of all the numerous ways there are to predict the market, you just have to find one that works for you 51% of the time to make a profit. I have also gained a, um, a lot of skills throughout this process. I have learned how to make and read uh, stock charts. I have learned how to understand and read uh, a company's financial, financial reports. Apart from those skills, though, my project was mostly about learning about the stock market because it is very complicated and with, uh, before I learned much about it, it would be hard to learn skills. Um, uh, there are countless ways that people have tried uh, to come up with to predict the stock market, but um, even if someone is very well educated on all those, uh, on all the ways to predict the stock market, they might just not be very good at predicting it. But some people who aren't very well educated on the stock market are really good at predicting, are really good at predicting it. Uh, throughout my project, I did not encounter very many serious problems, but the most problematic challenge I faced was when I was interviewing Ben Stats. I wasn't able to record the interview which was unfortunate because I had planned on that being part of my final, pro uh, final product for my project. Uh, the first problem I faced during my project was when I was sending the letter to my mentor. I had it in the draft folder of my email for about a month before I sent it, even though I already knew Mr. River's answer. Uh, even though I wasn't able to record the interview with Ben Stats, I think that was still one of the greatest successes of my project because it had taught me a lot about um, the stock market from his perspective because he works in it in a very different way than my mentor does. I think, but I think that best the um, most success I've had in this project was getting learned from both my mentor and Ben Stats because they have different such different perspectives on the stock market and both have a lot of experience from it. For the final product of my project, I started out by making a stock portfolio. Uh, it, this port, I started, I did this by um, starting out with 100,000 imaginary dollars and investing that in the stocks I thought would do well. This portfolio shows different information about the stocks I bought. The first couple of columns are pretty self-explanatory. The first is the stock you, I bought. The second is the price it, that it's at today. Third is the date I bought it. The fourth is the price I bought it at. The fifth is the number of shares I bought. The sixth is the date I sold it at. Bought at. And the seventh is the price I sold it at. Um, the so the seventh column unrealized percent basically means like before you sell the stock, um, what percent you either gain or lose if you sold it now. Those all say zero, of course, because I've sold all the stocks in my portfolio. Uh, the eighth, I mean, uh, the yeah, the eighth position value uh, shows how much money I put into that stock is currently worth. The ninth realized PL profit loss shows how much I either gained or uh, lost by making, by uh, buying and selling that stock. Then total portfolio value is how much it's currently worth. Um, the S&P 500 is a stock index, which is like an average. So if I had bought that with $100,000, how much would I have made, which is uh, 
96,627.09, and then mine is worth 97,568.85, so I did about 1% better, which isn't great, but also isn't the worst I could have done. Um, then the next part of my final product are some charts that I made using some of this information about the stocks in this portfolio. Uh, some of these charts show the uh, some of these charts show the uh, fluctuation price and time. Others only show the fluctuation in price. The first and simplest chart I made was a is a line chart. Um, this is a line chart. It shows the fluctuation in the price at the close on the day and the time. So you can see the time down there. So like November 23, it looks like it was at about 161, and then it went down to, on November 26, it went down to like 163, and then November 30th, it looks like it was back up to uh, one, I mean, it went down to 157, November 26, November 23, it was back up to 163. Uh, the next type of chart I made is a candlestick chart, which is up here. This chart is one of the most commonly used charts among uh, technical analysis, which are people who use uh, charts, tra uh, charts based on the past prices of stocks to try and predict the future prices of those stocks. So on a candlestick chart, it shows a lot of information. It shows the high on the day, the low on the day, the close on the day, and the open on the day. So for a candlestick chart, if the um, if the like uh, candlestick, the thick part of the you see the individual candlesticks, if the thick part of that is filled in, that means the stock went up during the day. The bottom of that filled in part will be the open on the day. The top will be the close. The thin part coming through the top will be the high on the day. The thin part coming through the bottom will be the low on the day. And then if the candlesticks uh, look empty. That means the stock went down through the day, and if it went down, then the um, top is the open, the bottom is the close, and the thin part coming through the top is still the high, the thin part coming through the bottom is still the low. Um, the third and final chart I made for this uh, project was a point and figure chart. Point and figure charts only show the fluctuation in price throughout the day and um, throughout the time you own the stock and not the, it doesn't show, have any reference to time. Uh, for a point and figure chart, you mark an X for every day it went up and an O for every day it went down. Um, I chose to use 50 cents as my indicator for what, whether or not I would change it, so I rounded every close on the day to, um, to the nearest 50 cents, and if it was different than the day before it, I would either mark an X or an O, but you can use any uh, indicator so I could have rounded to like a dollar or five, the nearest dollar or five dollars, and I could have used that. Uh, for a point and figure chart, see like um, down, down here, that looks like the first day I owned it, it was at 161.50 at the, at this X, and then the next day it went up to 162. Then it dropped to 157 the day after that, and then back up at 160. And then these X's, we don't know if this could be one day or a whole um, whole bunch of days. We don't know because you just mark an X for every 50 cents it goes up in a row. In conclusion, this project would not have been help uh, would, would not have been possible without the help of many people throughout the way. First and foremost, I would like to thank my wonderful mentor Steve Gruber for teaching me so much about the stock market because I knew very little coming into this project. Next, I would like to thank Ben Stats for letting me interview him and teaching me a lot about uh, the stock market from his perspective and what he does with it. I would also like to thank Ms. Hawkinson for keeping us on track during our project period and helping me in any way she could and my parents for supporting me throughout this project. Thank you and good night. Confidence in the way you present yourself. Hello, my name is Ellie Darlin.
Did you know that the way you dress and the way you present yourself can have a big impact on your confidence or that standing straighter can improve your mood? I have always known this and I love to present myself most with my clothes. I'll, I have always had a personal connection with clothes and for my 8th grade project I decided to dive deeper into this interest. I chose this topic because finding out how, that how you dress improves your confidence was very interesting and fascinating to me. I will probably want to do something in the future with fashion. I had a lot of ideas at first and they kind of all came together into this project. This is my mentor. Her name is Lynn Miller. She is a retired stylist and she worked for 10 years. She started as a personal assistant and then had clients ask her for help and became a stylist. I asked a lot of people if they knew anybody with a background in fashion. I also reached out to some pretty famous stylists and actually got a call back from one of them. In the end, she was not my mentor, but she did give some good ideas on how to start my project and um, yeah. She also told me that she had dressed some pretty famous people like celebrities and famous singers so that so I thought that was really cool to meet her. A family friend introduced me to my future mentor Lynn Miller. I told her my imagining of my project and she agreed to guide me in the process. We met every month. Lynn would make suggestions and give me ideas. She would also send me resources to read and watch and help me understand more about what I was diving into. She was a really great person to talk to, and I am so happy she was my mentor. At the beginning of my project, I did some research on how you, how you dress can make you more confident. Social science research show, shows that a person's physical appearance has a big, big impact on their life opportunities and goals. Physical appearance is a major factor in the development of personality because people form opinions by what they see in a person physically and re respond to that person accordingly. Nurture to nature is a debate that has, going on for many, that has been going on for many years. Whether your personality is influenced by your genetics or the environment you are in. In this study, it says that people's personality affects how others treat those people and so too does appearance. Certain elements of appearance, such as hygiene and a selection of clothes, are also functions of personality. In the realm, well, first, this is a picture of, on the bathroom, like, stalls, they have a picture of this woman, and a lot of people think it's a dress, but actually it's supposed to be a Superman cape, and I just found that, like, an interesting fact. That was cool to know. Um, that leads me into the realm of how the way you stand is another realm of confidence. I looked into doing some power poses. Now let's take a look at this person here. As you can see, she has her arms crossed, her legs crossed, and her head down, which gives the um, appearance of not being closed off, unhappy, and unsure of yourself. On the other one, this woman has her hands on her hips, has her head up, and has a wise stance, which gives a confident and proud and strong uh, pose. So that was interesting to learn about. Um, for the success that I, that I achieved during this project was that I feel like doing this project on beauty and style um, helped me become more confident in myself and my own personal style. How do these abstract ideas look when we see them from the eyes of a person. We have an opportunity to hear about this from a person whose life is having a major shift. It's normal for our styles to go through different stages in life. Let's hear it from my very own language teacher. So Ellie asked me to participate in her eighth grade project so she could help create some outfits for me based on what I told her about my style. And I was super excited about this because I really love fashion, but I'm not super good at it. So I was very excited to have this opportunity to have someone create some looks for me who really enjoys fashion and knows what they're doing with it. So. Ellie created three outfits for me based on what I told her about my style. 
and all three outfits were totally different and totally my style in different ways. There were some dresses and some pants and tops and things like that, some things that I didn't think I would wear, but things that went together really well and absolutely fit my personality and my style. So I think I felt really good about this project, my participation in it, because Ellie really got to know me as a person and what I liked and picked three very different styles for me based on aspects of my personality and I really appreciated that. I feel very seen and I feel like Ellie learned a lot about me and uh, hopefully other teachers and adults in her community as well through style. I think it is a really great idea for a project and I think she did an excellent job with it. This is one of the outfits I created. This is one of um, my proud achievements because she really liked the dress and just like everything put together and I felt like I did something good by like bringing her style into these parts of what I had made and yeah I was very proud of that. Um, this is a peacock. As you can see it has a very big tail that's very pretty. But a peacock's tail is one of the most famous beauty standards in the animal world, but it makes them slower and easier for predators to spot. How many of you have used filters to be in what we all might think the beauty standards are, are when in fact they really just don't serve us? We mold ourselves into not realistic beauty standards that aren't about what would make us happy. One of the beauty standards that our society has built been developing for some time is it's not just about the beauty that makes us beautiful, it's that we can help others see their own beauty and let's hope that this continues. But in the meantime, let's take a look at the answers that one woman got when she wanted to search for beauty standards were around the world. So this is a woman, she sent a picture of her unfiltered face to all these industries around the world. And here are some of the res results she got. There's Australia, India, Germany, Indonesia, Philippines, and USA. As you can see, the USA is the most different from what the original one looks like. I just find this so interesting that they just, how they changed everything. Yeah, I just find that so interesting. Um, I wonder how this woman felt when she got all these chain filter pictures of her back. Speaking of an interesting moment, I had a very awkward one when I called that famous stylist and I sent a message saying that I was an eighth grader and I was wondering if I could ask some questions about being a personal stylist. When she called me, she had apparently not read my message because when she called me, she expected me to be some famous and rich client who would pay $10,000 to get her, her opinion on what I should wear. Even though that was awkward at first, she took the time to talk to me and I appreciate that. I would love to appreciate and thank my mentor for being there when I needed some help or just being there in general and guiding me through this process. I would like to thank my grandma who was, <laughs> who was there when I was feeling very stuck on my project and needed like a way out to help me guide me through the hard part. I would like to thank my parents for being there from like for all my mental breakdowns and just like everything that went along with this process. And to the person who was there from start to finish, I'd like to thank Ms. Hawkinson who um, guided me through the process, who helped me find a project that I was proud of. And I hope what you take away from this is being happy with your own beauty and not letting anybody make the beauty standard for you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Florida Lovell, and for my eighth grade project, I learned about inclusive clothing stores and small business. During my project, I volunteered at a consignment store in Middlebury called Buy Again Alley. 
I hope to learn about small business and inclusive clothing stores. I learned about the way consignment works and what makes a store inclusive. I did some research and found several inclusive clothing stores in Vermont. I also found many online resources. Many LGBTQ folks cannot access clothing that's affirming or feels comfortable, and I wanted to see how I could change that. So I decided that I wanted my project to be about these topics. My mentor was Yuta Miska. She is the executive director and founder of Buy Again Alley, a small nonprofit thrift store in Middlebury. I had met her when I visited the store prior to my project, and I asked her to be my mentor. Yuta is a retired social worker who started the Addison County Teen Center. She moved from Germany to Middlebury 38 years ago. After she agreed to be my mentor, we met weekly for three months, and while Yuta, no, uh, uh, I forgot that part. Um, sorry, can we pause it again? Just keep going, we can cut this part out. We met weekly for three months, and I learned that Yuta is a very caring person. I learned a lot about managing a consignment store, including paperwork, hanging up clothes, dressing a model, or manic and dressing a model. During my time at Buy Again Alley, I learned a lot about managing a consignment store, including paperwork, hanging clothes, and dressing a model or mannequin. One of the first times that I came to Buy Again Alley, Yuta told me to impress her and show her my style by dressing a mannequin. I was so nervous, but I ended up having fun. I also earned store credit for my volunteer hours and saved up to buy things in the store. As a separate part of my project, I made a pamphlet using Canva design. I wanted to learn about inclusive um, stores in Vermont. My pamphlet included local stores, queer inclusive or queer run online stores, and free clothing closets. Some of the resources I put in the pamphlet include information on how to access clothing and gender inclusive items. I will be sharing this pamphlet with Outright Vermont for them to distribute at their center. There were some challenges in my project. Getting to Middlebury every single week was sometimes hard. A few times I misunderstood the instructions that Yusha gave me and I had to redo the task completely. Some of the systems in the store were complicated and took a while to learn. A moment I was proud of was when I finished tagging new clothes in a really good amount of time. Another time I was very happy with how, to, how a mannequin turned out and I dressed it. I noticed Yuta left the outfit on, for, on the model for several weeks. So many people helped me during this project, and I would like to thank everyone who made this possible. Thank you to my mentor, Yuta, for helping me understand what it takes to run a small business and taking time out of her day to teach me. Thank you to my parents for helping me through my project and putting up with me and always having good ideas. And thank you to Ms. Hopkinson. I could not have done this without your life-saving check-ins and guidance. Hello, my name is Izzy Gravina Butis, and the theme of my project was the care and management of show horses, with the ultimate goal being to bring a horse of my own to a horse show. I have worked with this idea before, in a sense, because for the past three years, I have worked as a groom for my trainers, Alice Cassidy and Casey Norton. Being a groom entails saddling and bridling, washing horses, cleaning tack, jump setting, and more. I have also been working at Hemlock Hill Farm doing barn chores for the past two years, which entails mucking out stalls, hay bale stacking, feeding, preparing horses to be turned out to pasture, and undressing them once turned in. I was interested in many different topics at first, but I needed something I could work on while I was at the barn I already ride at. I reached out to Casey Norton, who later became my mentor, and she had an idea of how to help me. I worked with Casey learning about topics such as confirmation, top line evaluation, lunging, wound care, hoof evaluation, lameness exams, and hoof testing, horse supplements, and supplies needed to bring a horse to a horse show. Casey has been working with horses her whole life, qualifying through multiple disciplines. After graduating from Champlain College, Casey moved to New Zealand to work for Amanda Brown, a top eventing rider. She earned her pre-medical certificate at the University of Vermont in Veterinarian Science. Um, Casey continued her success as an adult amateur rider, placing third in the area adult medal at Capital Challenge, placing seventh in the adult equitation 
in the National Horse Show in Kentucky and placing 8th in New England Finals. I asked Casey to be my mentor because she is such a knowledgeable horsewoman, along with her awesome attitude. She was flexible and easy to work with and really helped me expand my knowledge. Uh, some new skills I got were how to find an injury on a lame horse, how to evaluate a horse's conformation, and how to properly treat a more serious wound. I found everything really interesting, but especially the lameness exams, because I didn't know that people did so many like tests, such as blocking and ultrasounds, to find an injury on a horse. A challenge I encountered was finding time to work on my project, because a lot of the time while I was at the stable, I was either riding or working. Uh, this project gave me new knowledge that will be very helpful in my future caring for horses. Now I'm going to show a slideshow and I'll talk about the slides as I go. Confirmation was the first topic I learned about. Confirmation is how a horse's proportions fit together, which affects their balance, how the horse moves, and what level of performance they can reach. Confirmation is not about how clean a horse is or how shiny their coat is, but about the bone structure underneath. Proper balance enables a horse to carry itself and move with ease, power, and maneuverability. This is a photo of Clifton, uh, one of Casey's horses. He has really good conformation. His head and neck are proportionate to his body, which enables him to have flow in his movement and move really well. This is LeBron. He stands 18.1 hands, which is about 6 foot 1. Um, at the withers, that's where you measure a horse to. And you wouldn't be able to tell he's so big because he has really good conformation. This is Buddy. Uh, his conformation isn't perfect because his knees are too far in front of him and his head and neck are back, whereas they should be reaching out over the jump more. Uh, here's Clifton. He has good conformation while jumping as well as on the ground. His head is reached forward and his neck is extended with his legs tucked up underneath him. Lunging is another way to assess your horse's conformation to see the flow of their movement. The goal of lunging is to train your horse to move the way you want them to under saddle, engaging and strengthening all of their muscles. Here is a video of my mentor. This is a video of my mentor, Casey, lunging her horse, Clifton. Uh, lunging is where your horse is on a long rope, which is attached to either their bridle or halter. In this case, Clifton has a bridle on. Uh, here are two examples of what you don't want your horse's head to look like. The, that horse is holding his head way too high, and like tossing it in the air, whereas this horse is uh, curling its head down to like pull against the rider. Here is Clifton, and this is what you want your horse's head to look like while being ridden. It's down with his forehead parallel to the wall, and his top line is engaged. The top line is from the pole there to the dock. Another topic I learned about was lameness exams and hoof evaluation. There are many different ways for your horse to go lame. Uh, an abscess is a common cause of lameness in a horse. An abscess is when bacteria gets trapped inside the hoof. Hoof testers, which are the tool shown here, uh, can help isolate the lameness. You use hoof testers by squeezing on different parts of the hoof to see if there's any um, like pain or possible abscess there. Blocking is another way to help evaluate where an injury is. Blocking is where you inject a numbing solution into different parts of a horse's leg to see if then when they're moving with part of their leg numb if they still limp. Um, and so that's a good way to find where the injury could be. This is a photo of a quarter crack on Buddy's hoof. Uh, this is from before the plaster can is put on, and after it gets treated, then a plaster gets put on to 
hold it all in place. Horses are athletes, so they need lots of supplements, which was another topic I learned about. Uh, there are many different supplements for the different needs of a horse. Each horse can have supplements individualized to their needs. Smart Pack is a brand that has lots of different types of supplements for categories such as digestion, hoof health, ulcer and gastric health, respiratory and joint support. This is an example of Clifton Smart Packs. He has Cosequin, which is for joint support, uh, Smart and Simple Vitamin E and Selenium pellets. Vitamin E is naturally found in fresh grass, but the moment it gets hot, cut to be made into hay, it loses a lot of that natural vitamin E. Uh, he also takes SmartCom. SmartCom is, uh, supports proper nervous system functions in a horse, and it is ideal for horses that are excessively nervous, edgy, or reactive, unconfident, or spooky. The vitamins and minerals help smooth out the deficiencies in the diet. Lastly, he takes Smart Digest. Smart Digest um, is designed to manage digestive stress and support the digestive system. A common pain reliever and anti-inflammatory is phenylbutazone, more commonly known as bute. Um, it is very common to be a pain reliever and anti-inflammatory. An alternative to bute is banamine, which basically has the same purpose as, an, as bute, but it is given as an injection, which can give you quicker results. These medications are frequently used for wound care or as anti-inflammatories depending on the severity of the injury. A horse cannot compete in a show on banamine, whereas they can compete on bute. <coughs> Lastly, one of the most important factors is the relationship between the horse and the rider. A horse should be able to trust you and you should be able to trust your horse. I would like to give special thanks to my mentor, Casey Norton, for all of her help throughout my project and also help for my mom supporting me and making time for me to work on this. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Lily Gruber and for the, the theme of my 8th grade project was to create portraits of three suffragists, Mabel Pink Wally, Ida B. Wells, and Zitkala Shaw. Um, and a suffragist is an advocate for voting rights in this uh, particular sense, women's right to vote. Um, I chose this project because I wanted to learn more how to create a portrait and to acquire more knowledge of the suffrage movement. Um, since the beginning of art, portraits and paintings have been used to document uh, significance or importance from the etchings of hunters and wild beasts on stone cave walls to uh, pharaohs and tombs to royalty and grand castles. Um, I wanted to bring significance to women's voting rights and all of the way for future generations in form of portraits. I really hadn't worked with portraits prior to this project. Um, starting was difficult. The more experience I gained with the mediums throughout this also helped me in the completion of this project. And I think after this project I will continue practicing portraits. Um, my mentor was Misu Wong. I knew her from the Shelburne Craft School, where I had previously been a student. Uh, Misu is a professional artist and has done multiple portrait series. Uh, her profession and artistic knowledge was a great fit for this project. We met once in person in the fall and conversed online. And then beginning in early spring, Misu very generously offered to meet with me once a week, and we met five times for an hour each. Um, she helped me with angling and proportioning and gave suggestions on what to do with backgrounds, which was a tremendous help in moving forward and finishing the project. Um, I have noticed that the longer I spend on a piece, the more complete I find it at the finish, which was interesting to learn. Um, it was new to work on a relatively large canvas, uh, and I tended to struggle with enlarging an original photograph when drawing it onto the final material. Moving forward with each project I portrait, I became more efficient. Simply gaining experience was helpful as well. Um, the more I worked with the material, the more confidence I acquired. Um, and it was interesting how the less attention I paid um, 
to like detail and things, the more enjoyable the process became. Um, the backgrounds are probably the hardest part of the portrait which kind of surprised me. Uh, it was, was difficult to pick an image that related uh, to who the portrait was of. Um, starting the portrait was initially challenging for me. I only really began the portraits until winter break, although I'd started research prior to that. Um, so this is the portrait process of, um, in this particular stance of Mabel King Wally. But um, uh, there's, because I think this particular one, uh, she was my first portrait that I made, and it took me the longest to complete this painting. Um, so this is kind of what it was initially. Um, I, I just uh, began with pointillism, and I later added charcoal. Uh, so this is with a little bit of charcoal as well, and uh, a little bit more complete. Um, this is my first background. It has small pictures, and it was interesting because these uh, silhouettes of her leading a parade, a suffrage parade in New York, I believe, when she was 16, actually showed up in the later portrait after I had erased a little bit. So that's kind of like, kind of showed up there. Um, this is the final portrait. Um, so this is my first portrait of Mabel Pink Wally. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, um, I'd gone through multiple backgrounds, but eventually I painted uh, it kind of like a navy with acrylic and oil paints. And then my mentor kind of encouraged me to remove some paint, which kind of gave like this cool silvery texture, which I like. And um, then again, you can kind of see uh, the silhouettes, or faint silhouette of uh, the prior pictures, even though it doesn't really show up on some of the other paint that I removed. And around is kind of like a very light wash paint. Um, and then I also added a bit of wash paint on going down. Um, my second portrait was of Ida B. Wells, um, kind of uh, similar to the Wally's portrait. It does have kind of a charcoal um, for the portrait, and then uh, in the background is kind of a suffrage parade. You can see like the little sign saying books for women and things like that. The mentor gave me this idea, which was very cool. I liked it a lot. Um, and it's kind of just uh, acrylic, um, kind of with water, um, and like a city background. Uh, I didn't go through um, multiple steps to get to this background, so this was kind of the final thing for this. This portrait is of Zikala Shah. Um, it, the portrait, again, is done with charcoal, and then there's an acrylic landscape in the background, and the blue sky. Um, actually, all of these portraits were based off of actual photographs, although the backgrounds are made up. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to thank my parents, Ms. Hopkinson, my mentor, Misu Fong. I really could not have completed this project without you all. Hello, my name is Micah Whitman Fishman, and the theme of my project was to create an interactive journal for kids 8 to 12 years old that I learned to publish on Amazon. This project was not my first idea. Originally, I was going to write a short book, but I decided to change it after a few weeks. I learned about this project from my dad, who had a friend who had recently done something similar to this. It caught my attention because it combined writing, graphic design, and entrepreneurship all in one project. I never encountered an idea like this before, but I knew I wanted to do all these things, so it felt like the perfect fit. As I worked, my enthusiasm did not diminish as a whole, but there were many times when I felt like I was getting nowhere and that I had not made any progress in days, which could be extremely fr frustrating. In the future, I would like to continue doing things like this, and I am hoping to create a few more journals or coloring books for Amazon. 
Each of us doing this project had to find a mentor that would guide us through our work. For my mentor, I immediately thought to reach out to my dad's friend who had self-published before. Her name is Lori Fishman, and she is a psychologist who works with children and had recently published her own journal, making her the perfect fit to help guide me. She agreed to mentor me, and we met four times over the course, four, course of four months. We did our meetings through Zoom, where she helped support and teach me how to create my journal. I feel that Lori was the perfect mentor for me, because she would guide me while also giving me space to figure out and explore things myself. Along with our Zoom meetings, we emailed regularly, which was very helpful for my project, because I would often have small questions that needed answering that did not require a full meeting. Another asset that she provided me with was a YouTube video that explained the whole process of creating a journal and uploading it to Amazon, and this was a great reference I could use when Lori was not around. I am very grateful for Lori's help with this project, and I could not have asked for a better mentor. The end result of my project is a physical journal you can buy off Amazon. I'm going to show it to you in a few minutes. Along with having a physical journal to show, I learned how to do many new things. Before I started this project, I had no idea how any of this worked, but I learned that this type of journal is published through KDP. KDP stands for Kindle Direct Publishing, and you can publish poetry books, cookbooks, novels, comics, and a lot more on it. This allowed me to design my whole journal online, but when people buy it, Amazon prints a physical copy of it and sends it to the recipient. To accomplish this journal, I had to create the exterior components, like the cover and back, and I also had to create into interior components of it, like the inside pages and writing. When I first started, I thought the outside would be like the funnest, designing the outside and the inside would be the hardest, but as I worked, at least at first, I found the opposite to be true. Um, I managed to get the questions for the book done efficiently, but I troubled the actual formatting of the like cover and back of the book. The questions are designed for younger ages, so I designed them so it'd be interesting to someone who's like 8 to 12 and not an older child. At first I thought this might be hard, but I actually found it easier, like I think it would have been harder to do someone my age, like I didn't want to do anything like that. Um, and like I said, I found the formatting hard. Um, this was because I couldn't figure out how to fit all my questions nicely on one page, and it took me a while to figure it out, but when I did, it felt like one of my biggest successes because I could finally see how all my components would come together to create my finished product. Looking back at all the steps that I went to create this journal, I found the actual task of putting, on, putting it on Amazon really interesting. This was because, this part was also really challenging because it had a lot to do with like bank account information and stuff I had to do that I had no idea what that was, like how to do that. But I found it interesting because I've always been into like entrepreneurship and this felt super fun and exciting and like business-like to me. Also, I knew once this last step was done, I'd be done with this project that I've been working on for months, and this felt really exhilarating. For me, I had many successes in this project, but the three things I'm proudest of accomplishing are successfully publishing on Amazon, formatting it in a way that states all my information clearly, and figuring out the correct sizes for the pages and the covers, because that was really hard for me, and it would have gone kind of funky and stuff without. Now I'm going to show you the actual journal that I made. Um, so this is the cover, and as you can see it's called Daily Positivity Journal with Weekly Goals. Um, I chose this name because inside there are daily questions along with a weekly goal that the journalist answers weekly, like gets weekly. And I chose this cover because I found, I had found a cover that I liked but didn't quite fit my specific needs so I changed it up and put new writing on it to make it fit this. Okay, so when you flip open this, I know you might not be able to see that clearly, but um, it, I wrote a short paragraph and like a guide of how to use it. It says, welcome to your daily positivity journal. This journal was designed to let you write down your thoughts and feelings while also looking at different aspects of your day. Each day there will be a different question for you to answer. The questions ask you things like, what was something interesting today or was, what was one thing that made you proud of yourself? Every Sunday you'll get a weekly goal. These goals are designed to have you try new things and help connect with those around you. Each page will also ha have a section to free write. Have fun and see if you learn anything new along the way. I wrote this just to instruct people on how it works and to hopefully get them excited and interested in it. So there's, I think like 60 pages and they all are formatted similar. So every, 
with different wording, but I'm going to read to you the first Sunday, just kind of the questions, just as, yeah. Um, so, it is, um, so like I said, every Sunday you get a weekly goal, every day you get a daily goal, and then a special space to free write, and then you also get a spot to answer your weekly goal on days, on like Monday through Friday. Um, here's the example of the first Sunday. It says, this week your goal is to focus on ways you can help the planet. This may involve picking up litter, or maybe trying to use reusable containers. The daily goal on Sunday is more of a reflection of the past week, and it says, during the past week, in what way do you feel you've become more aware of yourself and others? And then on the bottom, it's a section to free write where the journalist can write anything they want from the day. Um, all the pages look similar to this with different wording depending on the day. Now I flip to the back. So here, I, I wrote a short conclusion and congratulations for completing the book. Um, it says, congratulations, you've completed your daily positivity journal. I hope you've had fun throughout this journal and learned to appreciate parts of your days and weeks that you had not before. Feel free to look back and remember all those times when you felt grateful and happy. I wrote this just as a congratulations for completing the book. And then I wrote, I did the backs. I decided to keep it solid blue and simple, just with a short bit of writing, kind of how like a normal book has some writing on the back that explains the pl plot. This is just explains what the book is about and hopefully draws the reader in. So I wrote, I just wrote, um, the Daily Positivity Journal is a fun and creative journal for kids to reflect upon their days. There are weekly goals that challenge you in different ways. Have fun journaling and finding new and interesting things throughout your day. I hope this would get the reader interested in the journal. This journal is all the work of my project and I'm really proud of how it turned out. Um, um, so you all can also buy this journal on Amazon. If you type in daily positivity journal with weekly goals, it should look right like this. And if you have any questions, you can ask me at the end of this presentation. I would also like to give a special thanks to all the people who helped me through this project. To Ms. Hopkinson, our class teacher, who answered all my endless questions. My mentor for helping me stay organized. I mean, my parents for helping me stay <laughs> organized and telling me when to take breaks. Ms. Floor, another of my teachers who helped me narrow down the different ideas I had for my projects and my mentor, Dr. Lori Fishman, who made this project possible and helped me stay, helped me stay organized and helped me whenever I had questions. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Molly Holty and for my eighth grade project, I wrote a short story about some of my favorite K-pop idols and their pets. For those who don't know, K-pop is Korean pop. Why did I choose this topic? Why did I choose this <laughs> Um At first, I wanted to do learn how to use uh, the program After Effects, um, but then I wanted to learn Korean, or at least conversational Korean, and write the story I ended up writing here. Um, but obviously there were many things uh, that, like there were many roadblocks, um, so I took out the Korean part and just wrote the story in English. Um, and I wanted to keep the K-pop theme throughout the whole project because I wanted to choose something that was going, I was going to be interested in throughout the whole process. Um, and I also really enjoy story writing, so I thought it was a pretty good mix of topics. Uh, my mentor was Elizabeth Bloomley. She is the owner of the Fine Pig Bookstore here in Shelburne. Um, she is also a picture book writer and the like, author. <laughs> and she, um, my mom helped me connect to her, uh, every show. And we also went to the bookstore in person to talk to her um, face to face. Uh, we called multiple times, and she was, uh, I was allowed to text her if I ever had like a moment where I was stuck or needed some advice on my story. And she definitely helped me a lot in my story writing, and I feel like with that, I feel like I gained many skills um, with her help. 
Uh, so, there are many things I learned throughout this project. Um, I learned how to convey a character's emotions in the story uh, by putting myself in their shoes. Because as the author, I know what is like happening because I'm writing it, but and I have this imagination in my head. But if I put myself in the shoes of my characters, because if in the story world, um, what they're seeing is what I'm writing. So um, it was kind of difficult and strange at some times to think of it that way, but um, it definitely helped me a lot being able to do that. Um, I also learned that, um, you know, anyone can write like a story or fan fiction, but um, it's the ones that are very like well written and edited that really catch the reader's attention. Um, and it will, I also learned how to write and upload stories onto the story book writing website Wattpad, which is where I put my story. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Some of my challenges were roadblocks, as I mentioned before in the beginning, um, but they helped me get to where I am now, and I'm pretty proud of that. Um, also problem solving in like the, I guess, real world, um, because, because of those roadblocks, I had to think of ways to make this project, I guess, work, um, and I feel like being able to have gone through that, I've been able to overcome certain challenges in my own life. Um, I think my main success was that I was able to finish the story because I often have a hard time having motivation to finish my stories. So I'm very proud that I was able to accomplish this one. Um, and it has an average reading time of about nine minutes, which is like a children's book. So I'm pretty proud of that. Um, so these are the characters I used in my story. Um, over on the far left hand corner, you can see some of the members of BTS. Um, it is V, Jungkook, Jimin, RM, Jin, and V's dog, Yantan, who is one of the protagonists. Um, and then here is three members of Blackpink, Jenny, Lisa, and Rosé, and Lisa's cat Lily, who's also the protagonist. Um, and then down here it is two members of Itzy, Leah and Yeji, and then here is two members of TXT, Subin, Bongyu, and Subin's hedgehog, Odi. <laughs> Um, so here is a summary of my story, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> so BTS's V, or as I called him, Taeyong, uh, he wanted to take his dog, Yontan, to the MAMA Awards, which is the Emna Asian Music Awards, which is being held in Seoul, South Korea this year, um, with the rest of BTS, but on his way down from his apartment, his group member Jungkook scares him, which causes him to drop Yontan's carrier and lose his dog. And so after Jimin, Jungkook, and Taeyong were searching around with staff all over the town, they had no success. So they um, arrived at Mama, but after a little while, Blackpink's Lisa comes came running out of their room, chasing her cat Lily, who she eventually also lost. Um, and there was a lot of like feelings of loss and sadness in this part. Um, and then while BTS were performing at the show, um, some very kind fans in the audience found both their pets and they were returned to safety. And so in celebration of that, BTS and Blackpink had the first ever collaboration performance at this show. 
uh, and they performed a bunch of fan-made like mashups from YouTube. Um, and then in the end, uh, TXT, Subin, Hedgehog, Odi, uh, Yontan, and Lily all were playing together and made great friends. And Lily and Yontan became very close friends, or I guess you could say soulmates. <laughs> um, I want to give thanks to my mentor for helping me along the way whenever I needed advice or if I was stuck on something. Um, my family and friends for being there to support me and giving me ideas from a project um, or when I was like, super stressed. Uh, and for Ms. Hopkinson for being an amazing teacher and giving me emotional support and supporting me throughout the whole thing. Um, hello, my name is Sam Bradley, and for my 8th grade project, I made a 2D video game. Um, why did I choose this topic? So, um, in summer of 2021, when I learned I was supposed to be doing an 8th grade project, I was thinking a lot about this, and thinking about what I like to be doing in my free time. And obviously, during the summer, I had a lot of free time. Um, I happened to be playing quite a few video games, and for my birthday, I even got a computer, which was um, funded a lot by my mom and my family, which was really helpful for this project. Um, I also was thinking a lot about, um, like, like the idea of, like, the code behind each of these objects inside, um, a singular video game, even when a video game is quite simple, it's also very complex behind everything. Um, and to me, like, all of the coding behind it just seemed to be, like, a jumble of, like, letters, numbers, and symbols, and I thought it would be really interesting to try, like, learning how to understand it better. Um, and also, I've, um, in the past, I've wanted to kind of go into this topic, um, but I didn't know how to, um, <laughs> I didn't know how to really, like, get started on that, so I used this 8th grade project as kind of an excuse to, um, like, try. Uh, my mentor's name is Christopher Anselmo, and, yeah, Anselmo. Um, he, it, he codes video games and designs video games for a living, and um, I met him through my classmate Zoe Stone, um, and he's a close family friend to um, their family. Um, he, uh, at the beginning of the year, I kind of had no idea how I was going to start this project. I kind of, like, didn't know what program I'd be using, didn't know, like, what exactly I'd be making. But when I did finally get in touch with Christopher, um, he introduced me to Game Maker, which is what I used um, to make this video game, this simple 2D video game. Um, he was really good at like showing me how to do like like the main layout of this program. And at first, um, it was it looked very confusing, and it seemed almost impossible to learn how to how to use it. Um, but it was actually very quick to figure out because. Um, Christopher was very good at teaching me about it, and he also was really good about helping me so that I could um, like work on it on my own without his help, because both of us had a quite busy schedule. Um, so what I learned. Basically, um, I learned, again, the mapping of the program, but I, the first thing I learned was about um, the difference between sprites and objects. Okay, so what I learned. Obviously, I learned the, um, the mapping of the program. Um, but the first thing um, I learned from my mentor was about sprites and objects. Um, obviously there's a difference between sprites and objects, and sprites are kind of like the image that you import um, into the game, and um, it's not, it doesn't have any code behind it or anything, um, but it's, you import your PNG image and then you can create a collision mask, and basically what a collision mask is, um, is like the area of your image that can collide um, is considered able to collide with other um, objects, whether the object is solid or not. Um, so usually you can give your objects a name and then you can assign it a sprite. So the object will look like your sprite and, um, it will, and you can put apply code to it and apply events and also assign variables to your objects. Um, character movement. So uh, characters in a game um, like the characters that will be that you would move around in my game, um, have to be the game needs to recognize that um, the character can like walk um, and jump and like fall. So there's like this line of code that obviously I couldn't make by myself. So my mentor sent me this line of code and I copied and pasted it into my game and I can edit however I feel um, to make my characters like jump however high or like 
jo uh, like walk however fast. And each direction and type of movement has kind of its own variable and value that states how fast and high the character jumps. Um, parents plus children. Um, that kind of sounds a little bit odd in this context, but it's kind of like in real life, like when a parent tells a child what to do, but in like video game making, um, when an object um, is assigned as a parent and it has assigned children, it's basically saying that any event that you assign to the parent will automatically assign to its assigned children. So I have a thing that I call object platform player, and I can assign like all of like the speed and all of the code that I mentioned before about the character movement, and autom um, it automatically assigns to all of my characters, because I have 10 characters in my game. Um, so yeah. Um, if statements and variables. Um, sorry, I always get lost at this part. Um, I need to read my thing, sorry. Get a side over there to the end. Um, if statements and variables. So basically, you can assign an object a variable and a value that is assigned to that variable. Um, you can name the variable however you want. So for example, um, under game underscore data, I have a, um, an assigned variable named picked. And its automatic value is no one, um, but it's also negative four. Um, Basically, negative. Um, I made an if variable or an if statement saying that if game underscore data dot picked is not equal to negative four, then when you click like the next button, um, it like goes to the next room. Um, basically, I have this character um, like selection, and you can select a character. And when you select the character, it changes the um, the value of the variable from negative four to um, a number between zero and nine. Because again, I have ten characters. Um, so yeah, and like another example is for Michael's character, um, if you left press on um, his character, it sets the game underscore data dot picked to six, so then I can now um, go to the next room without it like glitch glitching out. Um, basically, when you have an if variable, you can perform certain tasks um, that change the variable. So say like your character collides with um, a different object. Um, you can like say like if this character collides with this object, change this variable to this value. And then you can then that can automatically perform separate tasks um, saying like if this variable's value is equal to this certain amount, then perform this certain task. Okay, some challenges I faced while um, making doing this project um, was that when I would be working on my game, I'd often be like working on it for a longer period of time, and then I'd get so tired of it that I'd have to wait like a week or two before I could work on it again, and which like caused kind of a lot of stress because it was getting closer and closer to like all the due dates and stuff, um, and I was often having no motivation to work on it and stuff. So yeah, and then another larger problem I had was when um, it was a problem with making my object solid, and so when my character would run on a solid object and collect an item, the character would fall through the floor. <laughs> and at the time it was like sort of goofy, but then I ended up work, like trying to fix it for over two weeks before eventually I just ended up um, calling my mentor because I could not figure out what the problem was and I tried literally everything. And then my mentor did eventually fix it after a while of looking through all of my files and stuff. Um, but after that it was really easy. Um, another uh, contribution to making this very, like, a slow process was that um, I didn't want to, like, take any images or whatever off of Google or other websites, so I just ended up wanting to, like, make my own. So I ended up drawing on, um, like, a digital um, art program, like, every single sprite that I put into this game or object. So, yeah. Um, so for the product of my game, um, I have, uh, when you open up the game, um, it brings you to a screen to choose um, one of these ten characters that I based off of the people in um, my classmates. Um, so if I like select a character, I can go to the next room and it kind of brings you to this home page where I can go to like the characters um, or the levels or the credits, which I have not made yet. Um, and basically when you click the left key and the right key, you can move left to right and jump. 
and I also coded it so that when you fall out of the room, you respawn kind of at the beginning. So it kind of looks pretty goofy in the home screen. Um, okay. For my first, I only managed to make um, two levels with the time that I did end up having and the uh, how long it took me to make this. Um, but for my first level, I made it so that you have to, I guess, collect um, books that we've read um, over the past, like, two years. Um, and so you can, like, collect these characters and stuff. And I also made, like, a reset button to start from the beginning. Um, and then for my second level, um, you're, it's basically a level where you collect wood in this larger maze. So, um, yeah, and I also, I um, used these if variables in statements, and it was kind of confusing because I had to figure it out on my own, but basically I cannot um, go to the finish line, and it won't take me to the next room until I've collected all of the logs and completed everything, so, yeah. Um, in closing, I want to thank um, some people, um, starting with my mentor, mentor Topher, um, who is an insanely good help for this project. Um, he was, like, literally the perfect mentor for this. Um, also, my mom and my family who helped fund the computer. If they didn't, if I didn't have this computer for my project, I probably would have had a really difficult time completing it. And also, Zoe Stone for helping me find a mentor or at least for having a family friend to be my mentor. Hi, my name is William Hilgert, and the theme for my project is knife making. I chose this topic because I've always been interested in blacksmithing and making things from metal, because you can do so much with it, and every, so much things come from it. I got inspired a couple years ago when I went to Shepherd Museum, and I saw a blacksmithing shop and this blacksmith that was just pounding away at metal and it seemed like really fun and I wanted to learn more about it and do it. Um, after doing this for my 8th grade project, it was fun, to, very fun to do. I'd like to do this again someday, but it's tricky because a lot of the equipment needed is uh, expensive and it's very hard work. So for my project, I made a knife from scratch using 5160 steel. I learned how to use many of the necessary blacksmithing machines and, and the beginner steps in making a basic hunting knife from just a plain rectangle of steel while spending countless hours in a hall workshop. I made a handle out of cherry wood and a leather sheath for the knife to fit snugly inside that I customized with stamps to look unique. My mentor for my project was Bob Bordeaux. I chose him to be my mentor because he was very experienced in the crafts and seemed like a very trusted person to be working with, which was true. While I was looking for a mentor, uh, my woodwork teacher, I asked my woodwork teacher, Mr. Palmer, if he knew anyone who was experienced enough to teach me and was good at making knives, and he got me in contact with Bob Bordeaux, and I reached out to him asking if he would be my mentor, and he agreed. Bob Bordeaux is a very skilled blacksmith as he has his own blacksmithing classes and he has also been to many festivals and shows where he shows off his creations. The knives he makes are beautiful and can be sold for hundreds of dollars. If I decide to make knives again one day, sometime in the future, I aspire to be as great as him as it, at it. We only met a couple of times, but when we met, we met for many hours at a time. I went over to his workshop for the day and I would get a lot of work done. And seeing how it was in the beginning of the day compared to the evening was very satisfying because you could see a big difference. I learned many great things about knife making that I had no idea how it worked before. It was very interesting to figure out all the different types of machines that are needed and how they worked. I learned how to make a sheath for the knife out of leather and sew the leather together and make the knife fit exactly inside. I learned to, that to make a knife you need to be very precise and careful about your work because one tiny mess up and you could start the whole thing over which would be devastating. I also learned, learned to not wear sweatpants while working next to a furnace because many sparks will fly everywhere and sweatpants are not the most durable work pants, believe it or not. I learned that I had a good work ethic for the project and once I knew what I was doing and I got very interested in it, I put my head down and got a lot of work done. I'm proud I achieved making the knife since I had never done something related to this craft before. 
I think for the first time my knife came out very well, and I'm very proud of it. I'm also proud of the blade of the knife. I love the shape and how it came out. This project influenced my idea of the amount of work it takes to be that needs to be done to make a knife, because I did not know before, and it made me realize how a lot of things are made from steel, especially knives. It also influenced my decision if I want to do this again someday, which I think I do. Maybe not sometime very soon, but I enjoyed it so much and found it very interesting to do this kind of work that I'd love to do it again someday. So, here's my knife. So this is the blade. Um, it, so how I got this sharp and shiny was with sanding machine uh, that you gently press up against and it makes it um, perfect. Uh, it's a hunting knife blade so it can be used for many things, not just hunting. Um, here I have the handle. The handle is made out of cherry wood. Um, it was a lighter shade of brown before, but once we added finish it got this nice darker brown color. And it has gold fasteners on here that holds the uh, handle and the tang together. And it has a hollow gold fastener right here. And this is the tang. It's part of the original piece of steel that runs throughout the blade that is held together with the hand fasteners. Oh yeah. Um, here is my sheath. So it is made of leather. Um, it was a lighter color before, but we dyed it to make it this nice darker reddish color. I have where I sewed it together right here with um, stamps, uh, cool designs and my name right here. It has a belt loop so you can carry your belt or your knife around on your belt. In conclusion, I'd like to say thank you to my parents for supporting me and driving me to the blacksmith shop which was pretty far away. Thank you to my mentor for helping me and teaching me so much about knife making and overall just being a great mentor. Um, thank you to Mr. Palmer for getting, helping me get in contact with my mentor, and thank you to Ms. Hopkinson for helping us have a structured schedule for our 8th grade project and supporting us throughout the way. Hi, my name is Zoe B. Stone, and for my 8th grade project, I chose to develop a graphic novel and explore digital art. It was definitely a harrowing experience for me, and it's, I've spent more time on this project than any other art project I've ever done before. It was really fulfilling seeing my characters in a professional art setting, though, towards the end, and it's definitely been one of the funnest things I've done. My mentor for this project was Taylor Doe. He teaches art camps and classes for younger art students and designs card games and video games. We met three times, and even if it was kind of hard to schedule meetings, it always was very helpful, and he gave me lots of tips and tricks. I chose to write about three of my original characters, Dee Dee, June, and Damien. The city change, this changes throughout the story as they travel through the human and magical world. The story mainly focuses on June Dee Dee, the protagonist of the story. Dee Dee is a ghost from the magic realm who has been prohibited from returning. He thinks it may have something to do with the fact that he died a second time in the human realm. When a ghost dies, they lose their magic abilities, like flying, phasing through things, and go, opening portals back to the magic world. So when Dee Dee gets hit by a car in the human world, he needs June's help to get back. So after the turmoil of meeting a ghost for the first time, June agrees to help. Only after they make lunch do they set off on a quest to research this new world as much as they can. After finding close to nothing online, they head off to the local museum. They don't find exactly what they're looking for, but they do meet another ghost haunted, who is haunting the museum library. Although this new character is a cat ghost, it can't help them as much as they would hope to. It does lead them, though, to the magical book section, and after a bit of reading, they find a way to make a portal. June finds out that she has a knack for herbal magic and forges the perfect blend to make a portal to the magic world. But upon entering the magic world, they are greeted with armies of angry elves. When they're taken captive by the guards, Dee Dee informs June about the elf war and how they must have stumbled upon enemy lines. Wait around in, in jail is not the ideal situation because now Dee Dee has to return the favor and get June back home. Soon Dee Dee spots a familiar guard and ushers him over. Turns out it's an acquaintance of Dee Dee's named Damien. Dee Dee frantically asks for help but, they, but clearly they aren't the closest and Damien refuses. Dee Dee breaks down and June forms an escape plan. 
She finds pr plants growing through the cra cracks in the walls and remembers something she'd seen in the spell book before. So she forms an escape plan by melting the bars on the cell with the plant's magic. But Damien confronts them as they're escaping and won't let them go. But Dee Dee counter... I forgot the word that I was going to say. Um, Dee Dee confronts Damien, revealing how they used to be in a healthy relationship. But Damien got lost in the elf war and then Dee Dee went missing. They pour their feelings out to each other and end up reconciling and forgiving each other. Damien also said, tells them that that he so <sighs> Damien also tells them about how his father forced him to be in the elf war because there has to be one soldier from each household and Damien was the one for the job. Good thing though because Damien is really good at inventing things and helps them make a two-way portal. They visit each other often for weekend picnics and they all live happily ever after. I did a lot of research this project, mostly involving world building and comic formatting and writing fantasy worlds. I've always been interested in writing fantasy worlds and this project opened up an opportunity for me to write about a whole fantasy universe and seeing my characters really come to light was in this professional art setting was really fulfilling. Starting a graphic novel. I started this graphic novel back in October and the first work that I did was deciding the characters and their character traits. The first sketch the first sketch is an old sketch of my character, Damien, and so is the third one. But the middle one is a more recent sketch where I practice drawing these characters in digital artwork and just really solidifying their personality traits and their designs. Creating pages. Creating pages was definitely a hard part for me because of all the thought that had to go involved, that was involved in working with it. The first picture is a sketch page, and then the final is the second picture. Before this project, I've never really played with lighting and shading in drawing before, so it was really interesting and fascinating to learn about how to do that and what it involves. This is um, a video of the progress of one of my pages, and you can see I did a lot of formatting. Formatting is something I learned about in this project, and it was really interesting because you have to think a lot about reading this comic page and how the reader will look at it. So it, it's not as simple as writing a book where it's just left to right. There's all these different things happening, and you can change the shapes of the panels to convey different emotions. This is a video of me creating and sketching out the one of the final pages of a chapter. In this project, I learned about a lot about comic formatting and how you have to think a lot about how the reader will look at this page. It's not as easy as a written book where you read just from left to right. With all the panels and everything, you don't really know exactly what's happening unless you format it properly. And especially with like the sh different shapes and drawings, you can convey a lot of different emotions with the reader and how the comic panels interact. And this was really interesting for me to research because it's super fun and a skill that I definitely want to have and take with me for the future. Starting the story. Um, so finally I started the story where I would actually go page to page and continue with the plot line and meeting the characters and everything that needs to be done. This was definitely also a challenge because you have to have a really consistent work schedule and you have to be really focused on what you're doing the whole time, which is not always the easiest for me. Roadblocks and plot points. As I've said before, I had a lot of roadblocks and challenges throughout this project and I could be stuck on a roadblock for weeks, but I'd always eventually figure it out. A lot of times I'd struggle with motivation problems and finding time and like the continuity to actually work on this. It definitely was a great experience even though there was a lot of challenges and I, if I could go back in time and tell myself to do something differently I would say to start earlier and to really block out time where I can work on this periodically instead of just whenever I can. Final product. Finishing this project wasn't easy but I'm definitely proud of what I've done and the final product consists of an abstract of the plot and storyline with character details, and I've also completed four chapters of the actual graphic novel. I'm really proud of this project in conclusion, and I've developed so many different art skills and my art style has really matured over the course of this project because I've been drawing so much. 
And I'd like to transfer a lot of the skills that I learned in this project to animating because that's something that I've really been interested in. I'd like to thank my teacher, Ms. Hopkinson, and my mentor, Taylor Doe, and I'd like to thank my entire 8th grade class for supporting me. Yay.